Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is science writer Philip Ball, who worked for many years as an editor in Nature magazine, while simultaneously publishing a string of successful popular science titles, including a biography of water, a study of Chartres Cathedral and the medieval mind, and Critical Mass, How One Thing Leads to Another, which won the 2005 Aventus Prize for Science Writing. His new book is called The Music Instinct, and results from a lifelong passion for music. In it, Philip tackles questions such as how the brain perceives music, and why it has such power to move us. We began, though, with a question of the origins of music. The short answer to that is really we don't know. There are lots and lots of ideas about what it might be. I suspect that all of them are just going to remain ideas because, you know, really the the origins have been buried. And in fact, it may be that there isn't a single origin of music. It may be that it served many purposes and was many different things. It still is in some ways. So one idea was that uh, Charles Darwin's idea was that music was a form of sexual selection, um, like the peacock's tail, really, that it was a, a sort of an overt display of of skill that would then have some purpose of uh, attracting a mate. Other people suggest that there's something more social in the function of music. If you look at today at, um, at pre-literate societies, they, the music seems to really have that purpose, that it's very much um, a social activity. And, you know, there, there's the idea that it promotes cohesion and um, promotes group identity. Other people think that perhaps it had its origins in the musicality of mother to infant speech, which is seems to be something instinctively. Everyone does it in every culture. And it's, you know, it's very clear that there is more musicality in the voice, there's more rising and falling of tones, and that infants do respond uh, more to that sort of voice. How that would make a transition to something that a society as a whole practices in the various ways that they do is is far from clear. But, uh, you know, this is a problem with all of the ideas that have been proposed for the origin of music. It's very hard to to, to get further than a sort of plausibility argument. Now, you call the book The Music Instinct, and I guess there's an echo there of the language instinct. And I suppose you are implicitly setting music as, as something, one of the one of the key things which define us as being human, that's as intrinsic to us as language. Well, to be honest, the title is a, a slightly cheeky take on Stephen Pinker's The Language Instinct, because in, in that book, Pinker famously made the suggestion that music it, he called it auditory cheesecake uh, so his idea was that basically music is something that free rides on the back of other cognitive faculties that we have that it has no intrinsic adaptive purpose in itself it's just something that we do using thing using mental abilities that we've developed for other purposes and he suggested that unlike many other cognitive processes like language music could disappear from our cultures and we would just carry on as normal and i'm challenging that idea but not in the same way as many people have tried to challenge it in the past a lot of people interpreted pinker's comments as somehow undermining the intrinsic value of music they 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 sort of took the view that unless we regarded music as somehow adaptive it, it wouldn't have an intrinsic value that somehow he was he was saying you know there's there, there's nothing particularly special or important about music what i'm suggesting is that regardless of whether or not music is somehow genetically imprinted in our in our minds it does seem to be an instinct in the sense that it's something that we will inevitably do as a species that we have particular cognitive tools that make us in a, in a way make us hear the world musically that make us that give us a, 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 an instinct to group together certain kinds of sound in a way that makes them coherent and gives them almost the attributes of a language these are capacities that either we learn from experience or that perhaps we are born with i suspect probably a mixture of both but either way they're in our brains and you're not going to get rid of music without changing the human brain phil how did you make this vast subject manageable because it it stretches across millennia 
and you take in neuroscience and philosophy and aesthetics and musicology and all sorts of domains. How did you actually formulate a way to, to make it manageable as a project? Well, it, it often teetered on the brink of feeling entirely unmanageable and whether or not it ended up being manageable, uh, others will have to judge. But it was a tremendous challenge because it does take in all these 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 many different areas, as you say. But I think that it, for one thing, it's possible to to break music, the cognition of music down into a few basic activities or uh, functions that, that, that the brain does. So one of them is simply making sense of the sound, how we, how we hear pure tones, if you like, or how we hear simple musical notes. And then there's the question of how those notes get strung together into something that we recognize as a tune or a melody. And that's really where these pattern forming, these sort of binding principles that we have seem to, to come into play. But one of the biggest areas, one of the most difficult areas really in talking about the cognition of music is why it has an emotional response. And for, you know, for a lot of people, that's really why they listen to music. I think that's, that's probably a big part of, and certainly not all of, but a big part of why music has such a central role in so many cultures. In many ways, I think it's still the big unknown, but it's one that over the past decade or so people have become increasingly emboldened really to to approach and partly that's because of the the emergence of new brain imaging techniques which allow us to 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 look at what emotional apparatus in the brain is is being used when when we're listening so that was another area and then th there are questions about how music and language overlap in a sense how we hear music in a grammatical or a syntactic way and that then leads on to the broader question of whether music can have meaning in some sense what that might mean and you know whether music can have any kind of narrative power so there were these particular um, areas that i think are, are, are sort of common to to most musical experiences certainly in western music you know just about any sort of western music engages all of those faculties and i think that it, it's also quite clear that that's true for at least most sophisticated musical cultures outside of the western tradition